Any moment? Okay. All uh, right. It's nice to see everybody here. I'm glad you all survived uh, homework zero. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. Um, I think there was only one in my office hours whose computer we didn't manage to get assignment zero to work on. Um, but that's, that's not bad in a graphics course. Um, so hopefully you guys uh, all gave assignment zero a shot. If you didn't, I encourage you to load assignment one, which I think is already on, you guys already have access to on learning stuff, modules, modules, learning modules. I think you can go ahead and, and download it now. So our, again, remember that the thing that I strongly suggest to the students in this class is that minimally, the second the assignment comes out, you download it and just compile it and give it a run because as many of you experienced in assignment zero, that is a non-trivial exercise and you don't want to be doing that at the last second. Cool? Cool. Yes? No, two weeks. It should say two weeks. The course calendar is correct. We'll, we'll perhaps, did we not update the PDF? What was that? Is that right? Let me double check that real quick. It is due next week, I'm sorry. Um, I'll give a couple days. Maybe we can extend it to Friday or something because that is my bad. I mean, it has been on the calendar since day one. Um, I intended for you guys to have a little bit extra time. It's also an easier assignment than the other ones. Um, yeah, that's my fault. I'm sorry that I, I said that. Yeah, my apologies. Um, so even more reason to download it and give it a try now, yeah? Yeah, excellent. All right, guys. Uh, so with that, uh, let's see. So any other questions about logistics of the course? I, I appreciate that you, you pointed that out. Okay, um, one additional thing. On Tuesday, you guys have a nano quiz. Remember that that is at the beginning of class. <clears throat> and your instructor is going to have a lot of trouble talking. The nano quiz is at the beginning of class on Tuesday. So at 2.35 promptly, we'll put it on. It only lasts two or three minutes. The nano quizzes are designed to be easy, uh, but to hold you responsible for the course material so that you don't find yourselves completely cramming for the midterm, which is also designed not to be too hard. Um, Anyway, are there any questions about that? You can choose to take it on your computer or on paper, whatever you prefer. Yes? You do have to be in class. So if, you, if you're not in class, if you have an extenuating circumstance, uh, you can reach out to the TA and, and schedule an alternative time. However, there are many students who emailed me about skipping this class 100% and watching the video. Our policy to repeat is that that is not a thing. Uh, and, and everybody who emailed me and asked me that, I responded to them like such. The videos are for backup and study material. You are responsible for being in lecture. Um, your TAs are really nice people, and I don't know if any of you have emailed them directly to ask for alternative times, but their response to you, whether they know it or not, is no, unless you have uh, either, like if, obviously if, if you're traveling or something, we, we understand, but otherwise uh, we're going to send you to S cubed and, and get their permission. This is not like a thing you can do every week. Any other questions? Any other things I can threaten you about? Oh, yes, Elena. Uh, let me let me maybe, maybe rebrand your question in a more positive light. Um, <laughs> yes, most of the homeworks will use OpenGL. Very few of them, will, that will be the central focus. So the next one will be on modeling curves and surfaces using the machinery we've developed in the last two lectures. Uh, after that, you'll be doing uh, hierarchical uh, modeling, like skinning. So yeah, OpenGL is the tool we use to draw stuff on your screen. So it's hard to avoid it, but uh, it's very rarely will you be writing OpenGL code in this course. However, if you didn't get OpenGL to compile on your machine, you're going to be in trouble. So those are two different things because I think that's we're going to give you the OpenGL code, but that's going to be step zero to the other cool stuff that we're doing. Yeah, and it's a good question. Any any other ones? I feel grumpy right now. It's, I feel like we're sending lots of negative messages. It's a fun class. Graphics is a fun place. Okay. So speaking of fun stuff, everybody grab a sheet of paper or like grab one from your neighbor. I see no action in front of me whatsoever. Or like look over your friend's shoulder, right on the back of your hand, I don't care. Something, let's go. Come on, chop, chop. And what do you think I'm going to have you do? Draw four points on that paper. Eight. 
These are going to be the control points of our, uh, you know, our, 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 our spline here. My question is, if this is f of 0, this is f of 1, right, for our cubic spline, and these are our four cubic spline control points, can you guys all construct f of, let's say, 1 third? How about that? Let's be annoying about it. Yeah, so go ahead and do that. Draw yourself your favorite control polygon. If you feel like being annoying to yourself, draw four points that intersect and uh, see if you can do it. You guys remember what is the name of the technique that we'll use for this? It begins with a D and it's French. D. I heard it. Good enough. Yeah, to Castelgeau's algorithm. But I made it a third because I'm tricky. Do we have any brave volunteers that want to try and illustrate their answer on the, uh, on the board? I'll give you another minute first. Sorry, I get all excited and can't stop talking. It's a problem. All right, any volunteers who wants to mark how they would go about finding f of one third on their, on their, their, their cubic uh, spline here? All right, well, let me do step zero. I'm going to start calling on people. You're not going to like it. Which is I'm going to divide all of my curve, my line segments into thirds. It was a very precise measurement I just did. Yeah. So what should be my first step? I should draw two line segments, yeah? What should they be? Here and here? Mm -hmm. Nobody? You're killing me. Yep. And that's F, big F, zero, zero, one third. Exactly. Uh, you do the same thing with one right from yep. zero, zero, one, and then you have uh, F, zero, one third, one. And then from F, zero, one, one, you go down. Try that one again. Ah, oh, you're, you're very close. You actually, you think you mean this point, right? Because there goes, uh, yeah, and this. Yeah, remember this trick? We just keep dividing the same ratio. Yeah. So that's going to be our next trick. We divide these guys into thirds. Do the same thing. And then go a third along this guy. There's f of one third. Yeah. So, if you guys are uncomfortable with this construction, totally fine. This class just started. This is like the kind of thing that's very easy to write on an exam sheet, which is trick, a tricky thing in a graphics class. So, let that be a hint to a, a, a construction you might want to study and make sure you're used to a few weeks from now. Okay? But remember that that was the basic point of um, our, our previous lecture was we wanted to draw cubic curves. We have many different ways to describe them, right? One was two points and two tangents. And that led to a basis for cubic curves by what name? Is a different French name? It starts with an H, ends with Aramite. There we go. <laughs> exactly. Um, or uh, we had a different basis, which uh, was described by four points, two of which were on the curve and two of which defined this funny polygon. And that led to a different basis that we called the Bernstein basis. Right? And these are all just different bases for cubic curves. So there's no curve that I cannot write in one basis, but I can write in another. Right? They're just different ways of expressing the same set of curves. But there's a problem, which is this is not a terribly expressive set of curves. Right? The only thing I can do is draw arcs. Yeah? And obviously, if we're in Photoshop, we want to draw at least the letter S. Right? And we can't do that here. All we can do is one, one loop here. Yeah, and so the obvious next step in our treatment of curves is like, okay, so one of these guys isn't enough. How do we glue them together and make more interesting curves that are longer and have more than four control points? I would say as, as motivations go, this one's a pretty straightforward one. Okay, so let's do that. Right, oh yeah, here's our Bernstein polynomial. Remember our motivation, which is 
Sometimes I want to curve more, uh, through more than two points. And of course, if we use polynomial interpolation, we saw that you get this kind of funny, oh no, I have exactly the typo that I was making fun of you guys for last time. So if I have k points, I get degree k minus one, which is a typo that has persisted in my slides for five years now. So let's fix it now. There you go. Okay. Um, so, right, if I have k data points and I want to fit a polynomial to it, I need a degree k minus one polynomial to do that. But then there's this weird thing that happens, which is these red points, if I wanted to curve through these red points, chances are it wasn't this crazy green wiggly thing. But that's what I get if I fit a degree one, two, three, four, five, four polynomial to this data. Does that make sense? That's our basic motivation, is that somehow cubic curves are a reasonable sweet spot. We can control the curvature, but there's not like totally uncontrollable weird features that happen. Uh, and of course, you know, if we want to draw a curve like that, we're going to have to do even more work. Okay, and that is going to lead us, finally, like we mentioned last time, uh, to defining splines, which are piecewise polynomial, with some degree of smoothness where the pieces meet. Yeah? So in other words, I'm going to think of my curve as like f of t, when t is between 0 and 1, will be one cubic curve. When t is between 1 and 2, it'll be another cubic curve. Between 2 and 3, it'll be a third cubic cu curve, and so on. And then what I'm going to do is go to a lot of work to make sure at those individual isolated t's where I switch from one curve to the next, that they meet up with some degree of continuity or, or curvature, smoothness, what have you. Does that high level motivation make sense? Fabulous. Okay, uh, I managed to find you guys a picture. Here's a spline um, in the, the truest sense of the word. And indeed, this term does come from shipbuilding. And these people managed to replicate it. So uh, one thing you can prove if you're good at variational calculus is uh, if you actually minimize the bending energy of a piece of wood pinned at these points, which are called knots, isn't that cute? Then, then what you get is something that's piecewise, uh, piecewise cubic, which is exactly a spline curve. So this uh, is a term that predates uh, Pixar Animation Studios by quite a long time. Okay, so our plan for today uh, is we're going to talk a bit about when I use terms like curvature and continuity and smoothness, what do these terms mean? And then we're going to define yet another basis for curves called the B-splines. Uh, that's that's going to make it sort of easy for us. Remember that like the whole reason we define these different bases is that different ones allow us to do different tasks more easily, right? Like two points and two tangents, the basis makes it easy to just read off the coefficients. The B-spline basis is going to make it easy for us to join curves together with some degree of continuity, which is kind of cool. And then, uh, time permitting, we're going to move on to surfaces. So we'll talk a bit about meshes, but our uh, main focus in this class, which is different from those of you who took 6838, is talking about tensor products, splines, subdivision surfaces, procedural surfaces, all these cool smooth objects that you tend to see uh, in, in animated films. Okay, so uh, our motivation for most of lecture today, I have two cubic arcs, and I want to glue them together at a point. And of course, all the interesting stuff that happens at that red point um, is, is going to be what we're worried about for now. Okay, so the high level motivation makes sense and it's easy to get lost in mathematical notation and you have to step back 10 feet and say like, okay, but really we're just trying to glue stuff together to like not do anything crazy. Okay, uh, and uh, we'd like to do this in some kind of a smooth fashion, um, but we move fast and loose with the term smooth in computer graphics world. Uh, and, 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 and in fact, typically when we talk about smooth, if you're a mathematician, you're going to say, well, that's not smooth, it's like C1. Uh, and, and that's because making a curve infinitely differentiable on a computer is a hard thing to do. Okay, um, so we're going to start by talking about what does it mean for a curve to be smooth and to be bendy and have curvature. We'll do that for about five minutes. And then we'll talk about making that happen with the cubic curves that we defined last time. Okay, so let's talk about curves for a minute. And our motivation here is talking about joining together curves, but we can also define normals, velocities, accelerations, and so on. So on your assignment, which is due next Wednesday, my apologies, um, you'll have a, 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 a you'll, you'll essentially be sweeping out a surface by drawing a curve and then drawing sort of lines orthogonal to the curve to kind of sweep out uh, a 3D object, okay? So if we want to talk about curves, uh, there are a lot of different things that we need to do. So let's say that I have a curve P of T, so for example, a cubic Bezier curve. This is our favorite curve, my favorite curve. Um, 
And remember that we can think of t like time, right? So p of t, like t is a time, and the p of t is like a car driving along my curve. And then the exhaust pipe that, that has, you know, it's my car, so it's leaving a long trail of exhaust behind it, is the thing that's, that's, that's drawing the cubic curve, right? So what would I do if I wanted to compute the velocity of my car driving? I know you like all know the answer, and you're still quiet. Yes? Uh, okay, but let's say that I want the velocity at an instant t. Um, yeah, you take the derivative, right? Not that we, we only have like one answer in this class. It's usually yes, no, or take the derivative. Um, okay, and that's exactly what we should do here. Yeah, is, uh, is uh, take the derivative with respect to t. And why do we want to do that? Well, eventually we're going to have two of these cubic curves. We're going to want them to meet up. And what do we want? We want, like, let's say we want them to at least be continuous then the fourth control point of one curve is going to be the first control point in the next one. But then they might hinge, right? You might have an angle there. If we're going to get rid of that angle and have them meet up with tangent continuity, we got to define what the tangent is. And so in order to do that, we need to differentiate. Yeah? I'm going to trust that you guys have all taken calculus class. Good, I see some nods, finally. Um, so here's the uh, derivative here. Uh, hopefully I haven't made a mistake. Let's sanity check. So we have 3, 1 minus t squared. Um, then you get a minus because of the, you know, chain rule, yeah, and so on. Um, and so what is this thing giving me? So if P of T is the position of my car driving along the curve as a function of time, then P prime of T is like a little arrow in front of the car that's pointing to where I'm driving, yeah? Okay, fabulous. Yes? So with the original basis, um, could you just use the original tangent as a point and then the second one reuse them? That's exactly right. You're, yeah, you're, uh, you're anticipating our punchline a little bit, which is uh, if I want two uh, cubic curves to meet up with tangent continuity, then what I need is that this line segment of that cubic control is going to be collinear with the next one, right? But we'll come back to that. We'll justify that more carefully. So the first thing, remember last time we talked about a bit of a philosophical point, which is that P of T is like the position of a car driving along the curve. Does my car drive with constant speed? No, I mean, there's no reason. I mean, you look at this expression, like, this, this, there's a lot going on in that formula. Yeah? Um, and indeed, I mean, if you're bored, you can try and take the norm of that vector. I don't, I don't recommend it. Um, you'll see it's, it's not constant. It changes as a function of time. My question is, is that relevant geometrically? Does the speed of the car driving affect the path that comes out of its exhaust pipe? The answer is no. So when we talk about geometry, when we talk about tan things like tangents to curves, Talking about velocity and taking a derivative is actually not quite the right answer. Do you see that? Because if I thought of my curve as just a set of points on the plane, not as a function, but as a set of points, then I actually couldn't define the velocity, right? Because different cars might drive along that curve at different speeds. And they still trace off the same geometric object. However, they might, you know, maybe I'm looking at, at, at you know, t equals one half, somewhere around here, can I ever get a car, you know, that's driving along this curve and his velocity is like pointing out to the left? No. So all of the vectors are parallel to one another. So what do you think we do in geometry? If we want to talk about the tangent to a curve, it's quite simple. We just take that velocity and we divide it by its length and plus or minus that vector at least. Typically, by the way, we talk about oriented curves, which means we're kind of okay with like going in a direction. So the sign of the tangent doesn't matter. For this class, it's not going to matter a whole lot. For my graduate class, that'll matter a lot. Um, essentially, this is the thing that's associated to the geometry of the curve, whereas P prime is associated with the parameterization. I know that was a heavy sentence. Did we kind of parse that? But remember, parameterization is the thing that goes from T into the curve, whereas geometry is just the locus of points in the plane. OK, so this is thing one. If I want two of my Bezier curves, to agree at a point, does P prime have to equal the same value on both sides of that point? Careful now. Let's vote yes. Do we vote no? Do we vote like, I can't even right now, Justin's asking me questions with math terms in them. Like, I have two, I have two cubic arcs, right? Like, so here's one cubic arc, here's another one. I have two options, right here, 
is one option. This is my favorable option where they touch tangentially. Here's another one. Where I have another cubic arc and a second cubic arc. And let's say I want to avoid this scenario. I want them to meet tangentially. Does P prime of the first cubic arc at t equals 1 have to equal P prime of the second cubic arc at t equals 0? That's my question. How many of us vote yes? Weirdly, my left side. How many of us vote no? My right side. Well, the right side has it. Um, so what does have to be equal on both sides of the arc is P prime divided by its norm. So in other words, if my car hits this point and suddenly jams on the accelerator and doubles its speed but continues in the same direction, the shape of the curve is still kind of looks like it's meeting up continuously. See that? So these are the kinds of things we have to be a little bit careful about when we talk about modeling with spline curves. Okay, right, and sure. So uh, typically in this class we'll talk about regular curves. These are ones for which P prime is always non-zero. There's a boundary case you might be worried about where the car drives, stops, and then like turns around. And there you could end up with like a singular point that you like did, somehow didn't expect, but in this class we'll ignore that. You actually can engineer it with these cubic curves if you're like really careful about, I think if you make these two points the same, but I, di I digress. Okay, so that is the tangent to the curve. The other usual thing we talk about in geometry is something called curvature. This is the bendiness of the curve. Uh, and that's a, a much easier thing to, to talk about. And that, it's just the derivative of the unit tangent. And there's a phrase here which we're not going to explore a whole lot in 6837, which is that it's the derivative with respect to arc length. And what that means is that what is curvature? It's kind of like the change in the tangent to my curve. Does that make sense? Because if the tangent is constant, I'm driving along a straight line, right? And so if the tangent is changing a lot, there's a lot of curvature. So what do I want to do? I kind of want to take the derivative of tangent, call it curvature. But there's a problem, which is if I jam the accelerator of my car, what happens to the tangent? Well, it can grow in length. So then there might be a second derivative that isn't geometric in nature, right? And so the way that we get around that in geometry theory is we say that I force my car to drive with, you know, like at one mile per hour, and that will be the curvature of the curve. Yep. Um, there are lots of fun facts. One is that the curvature is always uh, orthogonal to the tangent direction. This, again, is an intuitive fact. Right? So in particular, uh, right, um, if my car is accelerating in the tangent direction, does that tell me anything about the geometry? No, right? Because it's just telling me that I'm driving faster along the same road, right? The interesting component is the orthogonal piece. Okay, so in any event, um, here's our, our high-speed uh, introduction to uh, curvature and geometry. There's a nice interpretation of this value, which is if you take the norm of this vector, it gives you the uh, one over the radius of something called the osculating circle. Anybody know what osculating stands for? It's really cute. It means kissing. In, I think in Latin, so it's like the circle that just kisses the curve. Um, and you can see that here, right? So, so roughly the curvature of a curve is kind of measuring like the closest approximation of the curve with a circle, which makes sense. Okay. Fabulous. Um, right, and then there's one additional object that we often define, it's called the curvature normal to a curve, which is you take the curvature vector and divide it by its norm, and what you get is a vector that's orthogonal. By the way, you guys shouldn't worry about the formulas here. In this class, this is mostly just a schematic picture that we'll be drawing and then and using it in a second to talk about Bezier curves, where this case is much easier than the general one. By the way, if you like this kind of math, this is my one opportunity to advertise our, our follow-on course, which is 6838, uh, where we'll define this kind of stuff really carefully. Um, it allows you to do really important computer graphics tasks like simulate shoelaces. Shoelaces, incidentally, and then I'll shut up and, and get back to the splines, are really fascinating objects. I encourage you to play with them at home. Um, anybody have a piece of string? Ah, here's a piece of string. Okay, so the question is, is the formalization that we have developed in this class so far enough to simulate a true string? The answer is actually no. So here's a phenomenon. I'm going to take one end of my laptop cable, burn about 20 bucks at Office Depot in the process, and start twisting it. And there's this weird elastic material, so I'm a little nervous this demo won't work. I bring it together, and the curve, after a little bit of a yank, buckles, right? I can't simulate that with a curve. That has to do with twisting along the curve, right? So all we've done is keep track of 
points along this object. In order to simulate these things, we also need to keep track of the twist of the material. Right? And so there's actually a little bit of additional stuff that you have to do to simulate this kind of thing. By the way, does anybody know what that, that buckling is called? You take a curve, you bend it, and you get this like funny curl that happens in between. It's called a plectoneme. Fun physics term of the, of the year. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if you like this kind of thing, there's, there's a hole as the tip of a very large iceberg um, for curves and surfaces. But returning to 6837, uh, what we're going to talk about are how to engineer smooth curves, specifically in these Bessier bases. Actually, not something we cover in the graduate course. We only talk about um, meshes and polylines, that kind of stuff. So in 6837, we have to be super, super careful because there's many different notions of smoothness and continuity, and they're all not the same, just to keep you on your toes. Okay? So for instance, here's a function gamma of t. It goes from t to t squared and t cubed. Is this a smooth function of t? Infinitely differentiable? You're shaking your heads because I think you're expecting me to ask a trick question. But yeah, it totally is, right? These are polynomials, they're differentiable. Differentiate them as many times as you want. But does it trace out a smooth curve? No, I plotted it for you here. It has a cusp, right? So this is the point t equals zero. And essentially the way to think about it is that my car is driving along this curve when it reaches t equals 0, what is the derivative? Is 2t and 3t? So what's the derivative at t equals 0? Zero? Zero. 0. Yeah, so the car stops, and then it just drives off in another direction. Do the passengers in the car experience, like, you know, do their heads get chopped off because the acceleration zips them in some other direction? No, the driver came to a nice stop and then kept moving. So as a function of t, it's smooth, but as a geometric object, it's not. We're going to use the letter c to refer to this kind of a scenario. So this is a c infinity function, meaning I can differentiate it as many times as I want, and it's smooth. OK, now on the right-hand side, what's going on here? My, 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 the, 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 the riders in my car have a really unpleasant experience. right? So when t is less than 0, I have t, t and t squared as my curve. When t is greater than 0, I have t squared and t to the fourth. What's the relationship between these two numbers in both cases? It's a number and then that number squared. <laughs> and similarly here. So these two functions actually trace out the same curve in the plane. But at t equals 0, what happens? The driver jams on the accelerator and the car takes off. Do you see that in the shape here? No. So is this thing c infinity? No, because as a function of t, it's not differentiable. At t equals 0, something weird happens. However, this is G infinity, where G stands for geometry. Yeah? And the reason is that, yeah, these things met up in a weird way, but they met up in a weird way that happened to be tangential. And that's all that matters in this world. That distinction makes some sense? This is like one of these annoying things that, like, in reality, is like not that difficult, but I think we just don't think about all that carefully in calculus class. OK. So that leads us um, to uh, a, a few different definitions, which are the ones that matter in this course. So first of all, when a curve is C0, that means it's continuous, so the car doesn't just like vaporize here and appear over there. Um, you can also say G0, and those two conditions are the same, unsurprisingly. And then um, things start to diverge. So G1 will mean that the curve has a continuous tangent vector. Remember, the tangents are just the velocity divided by its norm. So if my car doubles the speed, that's OK. There will be C1 curves, where the speed is actually a continuous function. And then C2 will be uh, when, I hate this terminology, but it actually is what people use in geometry, that this is curvature continuous, even though this is, has to do with the parameterization. I'm not going like, to give you a gotcha question on the exam, because I think it's bad terminology. But this is saying that the parameterization is twice differentiable. G2 would be that the curvature function, like that weird kappa vector we talked about before, that that thing exists and is continuous on the curve. These are lots of different classes of ways that two things can touch each other. Okay? And they're not the same. So for instance, what do we think? Let's see, we have these two sets, G1 and C1. Both of them are kind of trying to express a similar thing, right? That stuff kind of meets up in a tangential way. Is one a subset of the other? 
I see nods and you're walking into my trap. The answer is actually no, uh, right? And that's for exactly the uh, 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 example that we saw on the previous slide, right? This is C1, but not G1. This is G1, but not C1. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Right, and so the main ones that we'll focus on are, are, are G1 versus C1. And they actually do, people in computer-aided design care about both of these conditions, right? Because um, a G1 curve, yeah, the tangents can align, but oftentimes you'll see like kind of a kink in the curve because the curvature can have a discontinuity. Um, and whereas uh, C1 is a, a, often a, a stronger condition with the exception of this one case where your car grinds to a halt. Um, but, but we already saw that that's a pretty rare thing in, in uh, cubic curves. Okay, Whew. so finally we can get to the schematic that we were asking about at the beginning of the class. I have two uh, cubic Bezier curves. Remember they have four control points. And our first uh, curve uh, is on the left hand side, the next one's on the right hand side. First of all, let's say that I want these two curves to meet with C0 continuity. What condition on these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points? Do I need? Yes. Exactly. The P4 of the first curve equals P1 of the second one. That makes sense. Just like the last point of the first one is the first point of the, the second curve. Okay, that was a gimme. Uh, how about G1 continuity? Remember, that means the tangents agree, but the velocity may not. I see your hand there. Yeah, so that's the definition, right? That the tangent at P4 equals the tangent at P1 of the second curve. But in terms of the control points, how would I, how would I enforce that? I see it in the back here. Yeah, the, these three points are all collinear. Okay. Now we're going to get a little more tricky. How about C1 continuity? Remember, that means that if I'm driving along the curve, I don't experience, you know, my head slammed into the... Uh, what do you call it? Headrest, I guess, in the car? Anyway, you know, there was not sudden acceleration. How would I make a C1 curve? Yes? Exactly. Because remember that this line segment here is exactly gamma prime multiplied by 3 at this point. All right, so if I want the gamma primes to agree, then this distance has to equal that distance, and all three need to be collinear. How about C2? Any guesses? I actually don't know. I, uh, there, is, there, is a, there is some weird expression in terms of these control points, but it involves like three at a time, and I, I don't think it's particularly easy to guess. Okay. So hopefully you guys get the point. I, I'm like running around like a crazy person. Do you have any uh, questions before uh, we move on? Ah, uh, yes. Um, so we kind of got to see visual representations of like G1, like C0, G1, G1. Uh, is there any way to kind of have a visual understanding of how C2 differs from C1? Or is it just like C2 differs from C1? That, like, it's the, it's the That's a fabulous question. Yeah, so the question was, um, we saw what it means, like kind of the difference between C1 and G1. What about on the, like if I put twos there? This is just a little bit challenging. But in computer-aided design, this is actually incredibly important. So in particular, people who design cars are really sensitive to this. Right? Because whenever you watch a car ad, they're always like really concerned with the lines and the reflections and so on. And so in computer-aided design software, if you guys remind me, I can try and find a screenshot somewhere. What they do is a really fascinating user interface. Uh, and it's very typical for 3D modeling people to use it, although I don't think they understand what they're doing, um, which is the you put like a pattern, like a stripe pattern on a plane and you kind of hold it next to your car and you show the reflection of that stripe pattern off the side of the car and that's what you render. And it turns out that that, what it'll do is warp the shapes of these curves in such a way where you'll see the, 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 the G2 discontinuities as kinks. It's really cool that this happens. Um, it's a really clever trick. Yes? Can you have C1 and G1 together? Can you have C1 and G1 together? Yes, in fact, most of the time you do. Um, so in this picture, you would have C1 and G1 together when these are collinear, they're equidistant, and this distance is non-zero. Yeah, good question. 
Any others? Okay. Right. So, you know, for making a curve editor, it's not terribly hard to uh, design ones uh, with these kinds of things. Uh, so, for instance, where can we identify any points where our curve, the highest degree of continuity is C0? I think we can all kind of see it. Right, so that would be this kink here. How about the G1 point? This guy here, yeah? And I guess all the other ones are, uh, are C1, yeah? Well, certainly the guy on the left. Okay. Now for artistic modeling, is this necessarily a great basis or technique? No, it's like actually kind of hard to model curves with these different conditions because what they're saying is it's a little bit frustrating for artists. I move this point, and if I want to maintain C1 continuity, that point moves too, <laughs> right? So it, it, it's kind of an annoying user interface where like I move one thing and a bunch of other stuff moves with it, um, which is typically not terribly desirable, right? So this is a, a useful condition, um, but there are other bases where this is built in uh, to the basis, different degrees of continuity. And so it's worth mentioning one. We're going to be a little sloppier about this than we were with the last uh, three that we saw. Um, in particular, there's a basis called B-splines. Has anybody heard this term B-spline before? I feel like it shows up in CAD software a lot. Um, so B-splines are super weird bases for polynomial curves, where they don't actually go through any of the control points. <laughs> yeah? You can actually see that here. So here's a B-spline. Um, going through a bunch of uh, uh, control points. And they always stay in the convex hole of the control points, but they never actually touch them. And, uh, right, so these are curves that are locally cubic, um, and they're easy to chain together. The way that um, B-splines work, so here's like the four control points, and the red curve would be like the first B-spline. The control points for the next B-spline segment you keep three of the control points the same and you just pop off the first one and pop on the, the fourth and so on. So you kind of snake your way down the curve like that. Okay. Um, the B-spline basis uh, is shown here on the screen. We're not going to go too much in detail about this. It's mostly just like a good vocabulary word to have seen. If you want to apply to castle jos algorithm, but draw a B-spline curve instead of a, uh, a Bezier curve like we've already seen, Here's how you do it. I'm going to let you guys kind of puzzle through this on scrap paper. So remember that we had that cubic blossom object, everybody's favorite, given the number of questions I heard in my office hours. Um, and we labeled the points 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, like that. In the Bezier, ba or rather in the baseline basis, my apologies, you just give these points different labels, but you carry out the same algorithm, which is, I suppose I shouldn't draw the same control points. This is misleading, right? Because this curve will look like that. This curve will like sit on the inside somewhere. The label that you would give it is 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 5. And so I'll let you guys puzzle, like if I wanted the point 222, how to uh, get that by using the same basic tricks that we did last time. It's a good kind of advanced uh, way to check your understanding. Um, right, and so um, what does this allow me to do? If I want now a new set of control points, I'm just going to add a point like that, and it'll continue the curve with the same tangent at this point, which is kind of nice. Incidentally, if I want uh, my my curve to actually go through a point in the B-spline basis. The way that I do that is I repeat that control point a bunch of times. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so uh, let's see here. And so this, uh, this basic trick is called windowing, and it's kind of nice because what it means is that if I want to deform the curve while maintaining the smoothness along the whole curve, I can move the control point and it'll kind of affect some neighborhood around it and pull it toward that direction. But this is a frustrating B uh, basis for a different reason, which is it doesn't actually, it's not interpolating, it doesn't go through your data points. Right? Um, in any event, uh, here's like sort of a, a, a screenshot of a typical uh, B spline modeling environment. Um, and you can see what happens, which is like there are places where the curve just doesn't touch the control points at all. Right? Um, right, so like here's a, one way to kind of look at it. Okay. And of course, how do you think we convert from B-spline to Bezier and, and all that good stuff? 
using matrices and linear algebra, our favorite tools, right? So basically, at the end of the day, um, the B spline basis is just some other matrix that you need to convert you know, your, your, your geometry matrix from one thing to the other. Um, and so once I give you the entries of this guy, all the other information that you need to convert from one set of control points to the other uh, is just hiding uh, in this, these formulas here. Okay, so here's a kind of a funny illustration. Remember that all of these different bases are just bases for cubic curves. So there's no cubic curve that I can't write in one basis that I can write in the other. Yeah? But the control points are different. Right? So in other words, I could draw some curve segment and it'll have some set of control points for de Castelgeau style Bezier curves. It'll have some different set of control points for B splines. So that's what we're showing you on the screen. So here are two curves and their um, Bezier uh, control points. You can see they're kind of what we've already done a bunch of in class here. If I apply all that linear algebra on the previous slide to convert these control points, remember that's the geometry matrix, to the geometry matrix in the, the B-spline basis, I get a pretty crazy set of points. Yeah. Um, here's a slightly easier one to see the equivalence. Okay. So this is mostly just so you're aware. I think this basis is largely of, of uh, theoretical uh, uh, interest, but it is uh, one that shows up quite a bit, and so it's, it's worth knowing that, like behind the scenes, this is just another set of cubic curves, and, and you know, there's nothing terribly special here. And really, this basis is just engineered to make uh, joining curves together with a degree of smoothness. That's the thing that we care about the most, okay? And plus, it allows you to have one of the coolest uh, sounding graphics terms uh, that's, that's in the literature, which is NURBS or non-uniform rational B-splines. So here's a, here's a question for all of you guys. We now have machinery for taking cubic curves and gluing them together with a degree of smoothness. Can I draw a circle? Let's think for a minute. Can I draw a circle? Remember that cubic curves are cubic. As many as you want. As many... So I didn't say, can I approximate a circle? Can I draw a circle? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Circles just aren't cubic curves. There's nothing you can do about it, right? That's just life in the city. And so, um, right. And so, you know, you can try as you might. Um, you can draw as many control points as you want. You will never be able to draw a circle exactly using the machinery that we've developed. This was identified as a big problem in the 1970s. Why? It turns out architects like to draw circles. Yeah? Surprise of the century. Um, and and it, in fact, my graduate student's office is currently a circle, which is frustrating for placing rectilinear furniture. But, but that aside, um, there's going to be a trick, which I'm, you're going to keep in the back of your head. And in, a lecture, we're, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about homogeneous coordinates. And that's what's going to allow us to uh, draw, draw circles. The basic point here is there's many formulas for a circle, and one way that you can get it is using rational functions, so using like ratios of polynomials. And so here's going to be the trick in non-uniform rational B-splines, NURBS, which is, uh, there are many different ways to understand it. The non-uniform part is going to come from, rather than just doing 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, I'm going to allow the artist to actually choose the number that goes here, so maybe one, 0, 2, 3, 2, 3, 7, whatever, right? so that'll kind of affect the influence of each point. The rational part is going to come from a really cool trick. There are many really cool tricks in this area. By the way, many people were asking my office hours, is this whole class going to be this painful and mathematical? The answer is actually no. The first two lectures in 6837 are far more mathematical than the next 10. Okay? Um, but that aside, I like math, so, you know. Um, here's going to be the trick. I'm going to have x of t y of t, z of t. And in a NURB curve, I love that term, I'm going to add a fourth coordinate, w of t. And what I'm going to do is that my coordinate functions are actually going to be x over w, y over w, and z over w, rather than just x, y, and z here. And one thing you can convince yourself, I'll let you guys do that as an exercise, and then once we talk about homogeneous coordinates in the next lecture, we'll do it together, um, is you can draw a circle here, because now you have an option to divide. Okay? 
as a hint, I think you want to put 1 plus t squared in there. Okay. All right, so that's a, that's a NURBS curve, and that concludes our discussion of curves. So before we move on to surfaces, are there any uh, thoughts, feelings, ideas? These are mostly like the last, I'd say, five and a half minutes are mostly just terms that you likely will see in curve modeling software. So we kind of want you to know what they are roughly rather than things you need to know the details of. Yes? So when we're like representing, I guess, you know, or whatever, are we generally going to write it out kind of like that, like four coordinates, or are we just, and that we know that kind of means that we're like dividing by W? Yes, and we'll come back to why. Uh, this is called homogeneous coordinates. It's extremely common in computer graphics. In fact, um, exactly the same sort of phenomenon is going to happen when we talk about camera transformations in 3D, because cameras have foreshortening, right? Like train tracks tend to look like this in, in a photograph. And the reason is that things that are farther away get squeezed together more, right? So somehow you need to divide by depth when you convert from 3D stuff to the 2D screen coordinates. Exactly the same thing's going to happen. Any other questions? Was a good question. They tell me that I ask for questions, and then I don't actually wait for questions. So I got like a count to five in my head. It's all the whole thing. Okay. So now let's talk about modeling surfaces. First of all, anybody know what this surface is? It's a very famous one. You can actually buy it. The Utah teapot. Guess where it was modeled? Utah, fabulous. Yeah, at the university. Yeah, so um, there are many famous uh, 3D surfaces out there. We already saw the, uh, the Stanford Bunny, right? That was one of the earliest triangle meshes to be 3D scanned. Here's another one in the pantheon of famous 3D models. It's called the Utah Teapot, and it was one of the earliest surfaces to be modeled, not out of um, triangles, but rather out of like NURBS style surfaces. Right? So you can actually go online and download the NURBS patches that comprise this uh, teapot. One of the depressing things, you can actually find the teapot that the computer graphics researcher who was modeling this thing kind of had on his desk while he was modeling it, and he did a really bad job. Um, but that's okay. Right. So uh, in any event, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about um, surfaces now, and there are many different uh, representations of surfaces, right? So we already talked about triangle meshes, and all of you guys, because I'm assuming you all completed with flying colors assignment zero and turned it in for your TAs, despite it being optional, have dealt with triangulated surfaces, right? Just big triangle, piles of triangles. But uh, just like we discussed in our last lecture, this wouldn't be terribly practical for editing, right? If I wanted the Utah teapot and I wanted it to have a longer lip, neck, hand, spout, spout, yes. Here's my handle, here's my spout, yeah? Yeah, it would be pretty challenging to do that, right? Because there are a lot of vertices on those, those triangle meshes. And so just like we moved from polylines to splines, uh, we might want to do something similar with surfaces. And so we'll talk about a few different options. Um, these are quite difficult um, to deal with, and in particular, when we talk about different degrees of continuity for surfaces, it, the story does not carry through in a nice way. But it does a little bit. So we'll talk uh, uh, sort of from 50 miles away how to get subdivision and, and, and nerve surfaces to join together nicely. Um, so we'll first define tensor product splines. Very fancy term for a very simple idea, which is you know how to draw a curve. If you then sweep your curve along another curve, then you get a surface. That's going to be our trick there. And then we'll talk about some other ones. Uh, subdivision is a trick that's very popular in the computer graphics industry. Um, implicit surfaces are valuable for uh, simulation um, and procedural rendering would be like I write a piece of code that generates a 3D tree by turning the stem and then the lead, you know and then the branch and then a branch on the branch like you know like a piece of code that generates a surface is uh, what procedural modeling is in this class we largely won't touch procedural modeling it's kind of a specialized area okay so the simplest uh, surface out there is a triangle mesh that's what we use in assignment zero fun fact every triangle can be represented using three points, the vertices of the triangle. Of course, the pros are that it's very easy to render, at least if you have access to OpenGL. Um, the cons are that smoothness is, is not really a thing, right? Obviously, our bunny here, to be fair, this is a down -res Stanford bunny, but the actual one has more triangles. But you can see them, right? There are a bunch of facets here. Um, 
And no matter what you do on a triangle mesh, if you zoom close enough, there'll be a bunch of facets, right? And so um, there are other representations of smooth surfaces that are smooth no matter how close you take your magnifying glass. And that's our, our, our question here, okay? Okay, incidentally, remember our term here, tessellation? This is gonna be a big uh, thing that we'll be looking for in these different representations of 3D surfaces, just like for curves. Remember for curves, we talked about it's easy to draw a straight line segment, it's hard to draw, you know, a NURBS spline or whatever. Um, so typically what we'll do is tessellate. Like we're going to take all of these fancy surface representations and then just replace them with a bunch of triangles. But that's the thing that the graphics card can do. It's not a thing that your artist needs to be able to do. That's the difference. Okay? And that procedure is called tessellation. Um, as a, as a clarification, in, in this class we, we typically talk about tessellation in either of these things. Like tessellating a curve would be taking a curve and covering it with a bunch of segments. I think the more typical uh, usage of this term is on like a surface. Okay, so let's introduce a very simple surface representation, the tensor product surface. So I've given you a curve. Notice that we're, we're going to stop using t because t is like time and now we're in two-dimensional world. And we're going to use u and v instead. By the way, uh, yeah, and this is for whatever reason the letters you see are everywhere in graphics. They always refer to this kind of thing, right? Like, when you talk about surface parameterization, they typically talk about UV computation. Okay, so here is a uh, Bezier curve, our favorite kind of curve, right? You can see the four control points and the curve. Notice there's only a U here. How can I make a surface out of this? What can I do? One thing I could do is think of these four points as functions of a second parameter, v, right? So as a function of v, like let's say that I start sweeping these points horizontally like that, then what am I going to get? At different v values, I'm going to get different curves. And as I look at the locus of all of those curves, I'll get a surface. Does that make sense from a high level? So that idea is called a tensor product surface. And the idea is this is a curve. Now, I'm going to give four control points in this direction to specify the motion of the first control point in V. And now, when you put all those things together, it's going to sweep out a surface. Sneaky, huh? Okay. We'll see that uh, there's one kind of asymmetry in the way that I've described this, right? That we kind of did U and then V. We're going to see the reality that didn't, that didn't matter. They, they, they commute. Okay, so that's going to be our goal, is to sweep those control points over curves of their own, and then behind them is going to drag a surface. Okay. And, you know, we only got one hammer. We might as well hit as many nails as we can. So how do we think we're going to describe these curves in V? Also using Bezier control points, because why not, right? So here's what this looks like, right? So here, for instance, these four points might be the control points of this curve in V space. Now if I read it at a fixed V and look in the U direction, then I get the control points of a curve going this way. Sneaky. Okay, and if I look at all of those things together, I get a 2D surface patch. All right, um, and these objects are called tensor product uh, Bezier patches, and then basically the, this corresponds to making the thing in the V direction be a Bezier curve. Um, yeah, and if we hold either U or V constant, we get a cubic curve. This is nice because it's essentially just reusing machinery that we've already developed in 6837, so that's pretty cool. The, uh, what is the takeaway? If I wanted to model a triangle, <laughs> or like a bent triangle, I guess, here, it would be kind of annoying, right? Like all of my surfaces here have like four sides. Yeah, so that's the, the sort of downside of using this representation. Um, right, and so this object is called a Bezier, a bicubic Bezier surface. It has 16 control points, right? Because you have four control points and you have to sweep it the other way. Uh, and let's do a little bit of math, just because it's ugly, and I thought I'd impress you with the number of symbols that we can write on the screen. Um, all right. So here's what this looks like. Remember that we have the, uh, the, the, the Bezier basis, right? That's B1, B2, B3, and B4. So if I fix, um, right, if I fix V, and I want to look this direction and see what curve I sweep out in U, this would be the formula, right? Because this is the, uh, this is the basis functions in U applied to our control points at this fixed V. 
You can just forget that V, right? They're just four control points. And this is the formula we had in the previous lecture. Does that make sense? You should stop me. It's going to be really boring. So these are four control points, and we're combining them with weights that vary in the U variable, and that's what's tracing out the U curve, just like before. Think of U like T. Now, our four points are also functions of V, and what are those? Those are also Bezier curves, so you can also write this in that form in their control points. So what am I going to do to make this as ugly as possible? I'm going to take this formula, I'm going to plug it in there. And that's going to give me one giant formula for this thing as a function of u and v at the same time. Okay? So, let's do that. I do not encourage you to write this down in your scrap paper. I don't think you're going to learn anything. But what you get, which I typed in nice LaTeX notation here because I think the word is a little ugly. Um, so here's where I just plugged it in, right? So here's bi of u, and then I took this expression and dropped it in the interior for the control points. And now I'm going to factor the sums to the outside. Right? So that's what I've done here. And notice that a really beautiful thing happens. Here's the control points, pij. Here is, in some sense, a basis function, but now it's a basis function for bicubic patches. And what is bij? This is the product of bi and bj. <laughs> yeah. So why do we go through this whole uh, this whole argument? Essentially, here are your, your 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 16 control points are hiding here, and you have 16 two-dimensional basis functions, which are secretly just the product of two 1D things. Does everybody understand the construction there? Basically, all I did was take a cubic curve, and then for the four points on that curve, make those cubic curves and then just crunch the whole thing together. And the kind of nice thing is, by the way, notice that I started with u and then I did v. From this formula, it's very clear that if I started with v and done u, I'd get the same 16 control points. So there's, there's order in the universe. Okay, so this is called a tensor product Bezier patch. Tensor product is a fancy term for like a one-dimensional object, so if I put two of those together, I get a two-dimensional object. I can do this a third time, by the way, and sweep out a volume if I really wanted to. Um, they're defined by 16 control points. Artists don't always love these things because that's a lot of points to control, like kind of a simple patch. But mathematically, they're quite easy to work with. Um, the bases are just products of the Bernstein polynomial, so that's pretty nice. Um, you guys remember from your calculus class how to get the tangent to a surface and the normal to a surface? Yes. That's exactly right. So if I take the derivative in the u direction, I'll get a tangent in the u direction. If I get to take the derivative in the v direction, I'll get the tangent in the v direction. If I take the cross product of those two vectors, I'll get the normal to the surface. That we hopefully, yeah, I see some knots, so this is good. We're just dredging up our old calculus here. Um, incidentally, for your homework this coming week, do the Derivatives in the u and v directions, are they necessarily perpendicular? This picture kind of suggests that they are. The answer is no. Yeah? Good. Just remember that. Okay. And in case you uh, really wanted to drive yourself crazy, remember that we had this crazy notation for curves, right? The geometry matrix, the spline matrix, and the sort of simple basis. Fun fact, because every year one student asks me, you can do this for these surfaces too. Um, it's really nasty, and we're going to omit that in 6837. I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Right, so that's, uh, that's the big uh, the point of these tensor product surfaces. One thing to know, I mean, we talked about tensor product um, Bezier curves. You could also do tensor product B-spline surfaces, and that would just be a different set of control points. Right? The, 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 the math would be identical. Okay. And so the, uh, the pros here are that these are smooth surfaces, right? There are no triangles to be found. I can zoom in as close as I want, and this is just a cubic thing. Um, they're defined by a reasonably small set of points, but these are hard to render. It's, it's certainly not obvious to me how you would draw something that's not flat like this. And so before you can render one of these objects, you first have to tessellate it. And there's a trickier matter, which is let's say I have these 16 control points of one patch, and now I want to glue that on to another patch, like my Utah teapot. Uh, so you probably wallpaper about four things along the side of the teapot. And you want those to meet with tangent continuity. That's super annoying <laughs> to work out. And the reason why is you're controlling 16 points, 
But remember that I've swept out an entire curve along which the tangent has to match. Right? So working out that condition is not necessarily the same as just the tangent continuity of those four points that I know how to control. Right? And that's where this stuff gets really nasty. So if you like this stuff, you should go into the mechanical engineering department, take a course on computer-aided geometric design, where they like, will work these details out. They're painful and no fun for anybody. Um, here's the Utah teapot in its full glory, including all of the uh, Bezier splines. This was uh, designed by Martin Null. I don't know who that is. Um, and you can see the, the different control points of these patches. Probably given the software of the day, my bet is that he just sat there at his computer and guessed points in 3D until these things matched together, which I imagine was no fun for anybody involved. Okay. As a, incidentally, one, one thing to note here, tensor product surfaces tend to be big patches on a surface. Of course, in modern computer graphics, we want like small, cool, textured surfaces, and those would be really hard to model here, right? Because every single one of them would need 16 control points. You're somehow back to the regime where uh, you might as well use triangles, right, if you wanted like a bumpy surface. And so there's a trick that we often use called displacement mapping, where what you'll do is maybe um, you'll think of your surface at a high level as being a tensor product smooth surface. But now in UV coordinates, I'm going to store like a JPEG image. So just like a two-dimensional grid of numbers in the UV plane, which tells me I'm first going to compute that tensor product surface, and then I'm going to take the surface and displace it along the normal sum amount specified in that image, because that's actually not terribly hard to do. Um, and so this trick is called displacement mapping, where the artist will actually take a paintbrush to the surface and paint on little bumps, which are just stored in an image plane rather than uh, using all this fancy 3D stuff. It's a nice trick. Um, and so this is used very heavily in movies because it's very artist controllable, it's high resolution, and it kind of jibes well with this tensor product surface, right? Because tensor products are already kind of stored in a two-dimensional way. Um, and it can have some nice effects. So like, here's a very typical kind of user interface. This is uh, drawn using a tool called ZBrush, which is a very popular one in graphics field. And you can see here's the tensor product, the animated guy. I won't even try to characterize what kind of creature this is. And uh, you know, here's uh, what he looks like. You can paint on his hair follicles and skin folds, all that stuff. Okay, so this is one uh, way to model surfaces. And the advantage is it's extremely controllable. There are all kinds of cool extensions uh, you can do. We're going to return to some of these when we talk about ray tracing. Um, but having them meet together in a smooth fashion is quite difficult. Um, so now we're going to talk about one additional trick. We'll probably start today and continue next lecture because as usual, I'm getting all excited about surfaces and running out of time. Uh, and that is a piece of machinery called subdivision surfaces. And this is really actually, I think, you know, a lot of what we've talked about so far is just generic math, like you could find it in a math textbook. This, I think, really did come out of the computer graphics world um, about 15, 20 years ago. And well, gosh, <laughs> 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, is a, a really beautiful piece of machinery for modeling smooth surfaces in a way where they meet up and it's not so painful to enforce those sorts of, of criteria like what we talked about. So for instance, here's the bunny. And in subdivision surfaces, what we do is we take a very coarse geometric object and then we're going to write down an algorithm which takes the coarse geometric object and gives you rules for taking every triangle and like dividing into four. And then taking every triangle of this guy and dividing it into four and placing their vertices in such a way where this process converges on a smooth object. It's kind of similar. Remember we, when we talked about de castle jos algorithm, we started with that control polygon, we divided it in half, then we got control points for the two sides of the curve. Somehow this is a similar procedure in 3D, but uh, it won't have quite as nice a picture as this de castle jos picture we had on the screen. And these are really just beautiful tools. They're so cool. You should implement them and play with them at home. Okay. Um, we're a little low on time, so I'll let you watch this YouTube video at home. The, the sort of landmark in subdivision and cloth modeling, by the way, was this Pixar animated short called uh, Jerry's Game. Uh, it was 1997. Um, it was this old guy playing chess with himself. Uh, and I'll, uh, if you zoom in really, really close to the video, you'll see the surfaces are still smooth. Whereas the Pixar films before that, they were like triangulated and blocky. Yes? Cool. Well, there's a great thing you can do, which is to put the title into Google, and I'm sure it'll come right up. Yeah. OK. Uh, so subdivision uh, surfaces are uh, 
sort of come from a basic observation, which is that there are a lot of geometric processes, almost kind of mysteriously. Like this is one of these areas where I think people described it phenomenologically a lot earlier than they described it mathematically. Like a lot of these tools were in practice before they were sort of described. I would argue it's kind of similar to some machine learning tools we have now. Um, so some people noticed that you could do certain things to curves and surfaces to smooth them out, and you could do it recursive fashion and actually um, converge on something nice. Right? So for instance, here's a very famous algorithm. It's called corner cutting. It's exactly what it sounds like. So I have a polygon. I take every polygon and I divide it in a ratio of 1 to 4, or 1 to 3, rather. I'm going to do that to every edge. Right? So here I did it to one edge. If I do it to all of them, what happened? I started with something kind of blocky. Already it looks kind of smooth. If I do that again, it looks even smoother. If I do it a bunch of times. One thing you can convince yourself is it'll actually give you a B-spline curve. Here's the thing. People guessed to the corner cutting algorithm a lot earlier than they guessed this fancy weird B-spline basis. Right? Because it's not so hard. You're going to say like, oh, I have this polygonal object. I want to kind of smooth it out. So I'm just going to start cutting the corners off. Right? And so this was a very common procedure where you take the mesh and you start introducing additional vertices in carefully chosen locations. And then this procedure, people noticed, tends to converge to a smooth object. And this is super cool for a lot of reasons. One is that this algorithm is parallelizable. Yeah? Um, and it's, it's sort of very nicely compatible with graphics cards, right? Because it just divides into this very massively kind of dislocated computation that you can do. And so that's the, the sort of high level idea of subdivision curves and surfaces is just to find <laughs> clever ways to cut corners and then smooth stuff out in a recursive fashion. And then the really non-trivial math comes in proving that this procedure, when you take it to the limit, actually gives you a smooth object back. The headache is going to be that on a triangulated mesh, things are a lot more irregular, right? Vert some vertices might be adjacent to six triangles. Some vertices might be adjacent to 25 triangles. And so that corner cutting procedure is going to be a lot more complicated than on a curve where every vertex is adjacent to two line segments. Okay. So there are many different um, algorithms out there for this sort of thing. We'll talk about two in this class. And the basic ingredient that you need for subdivision is some base piece of geometry. Right? That's going to be the thing that you uh, start subdividing. And the, the two usual ones that people talk about are triangulated surfaces. Right? That's what we've already talked about in this course. And then quadrangulated surfaces, or quads. Um, these have different advantages. Quad meshes are kind of nice because typically they look like grids, except when they don't. If you like that kind of thing, uh, you should hang out with my graduate students who study those points. It turns out there's a lot you can say about them. Um, triangle meshes, uh, the advantage, the blessing and the curse is that there's just such a mess that there's very little you can say. So any, any uh, subdivision algorithm that you, you come up with triangulated surfaces kind of has to work all over the place. Okay. <clears throat> and so the two algorithms that we'll talk about in A37 are loop subdivision. This is actually named after a human being. I think his name is Charles Loop. Um, and uh, 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 Catmull Clark subdivision. Um, does the name Catmult stand out to anybody? This is uh, now, I guess, a, a bit higher up in the Disney Corporation. Um, it's kind of funny. A lot of these uh, old graphics researchers are now CEOs and, and stuff like that. Okay. So in order to talk about a subdivision rule, I need to do two things. I need to do topology and I need to do geometry. Here, when I say topology, what I mean, we're going to start with a triangle mesh. And we're going to generate a new triangle mesh with more vertices. Right? So I have to tell you, what does that mean? Like, where do I insert vertices in this structure? Right? And there are many different options. In the corner cutting algorithm, it was pretty easy. Right? I just took every line segment and I divided it into three line segments. But here I have a lot of choices. Right? I could stick a vertex in the center of every triangle and connect it to the three outside things, or I could subdivide the edges and so on. There's a, there's a decision to be made here. Right? And then the geometry aspect will be, okay, where do I put those new vertices? Okay, so let's do that. So, we're going to talk about loop subdivision first. And here's what loop proposed. It's just that we're going to use a color scheme which is going to become a hot mess in a second. So, the red points are going to be the original mesh, and we're going to do one iteration of subdivision. We're going to color those points differently. Does that make sense? Cool. So, in loop subdivision, we're going to take every 
edge of our mesh, we're going to subdivide it by inserting a vertex in between it. We're going to take every triangle and subdivide it into four in the pattern that you see here. Does that make sense? Cool. There's already a beautiful thing that you should notice here. There's so many beautiful things. I love these algorithms. This is so cool. Okay. Take a look at this vertex. How many neighbors does he have? Six. Let's say that this green triangle mesh continued, like this is just a little snapshot of the interior of a giant mesh. How many neighbors would this blue vertex have? How many neighbors would this blue vertex have? This is not a mistake. And in fact, one thing you can prove is that on any closed spherical surface, the average number of neighbors any vertex has is six. Okay? Um, but in any event, the nice thing about this subdivision algorithm, as you start to run it, the number of vertices that don't have six neighbors decreases exponentially. So it turns out the geometry at these points is not going to matter a ton. It'll matter somewhat, but not a ton. Okay, um, fun vocabulary word, a mesh where most vertices have valence six is called semi-regular. What do you think vertices are called that don't have six neighbors? Irregular. Irregular? Uh, now I can get you to participate. Great. Yep. Um, right, so it's a sum but not all. A completely regular mesh. Let's say that I have a triple torus, so that's like three donuts glued together. I dream about these sometimes. Um, I challenge you to come up with a regular, not a semi-regular mesh of that object. I'll give you a hint, it's actually impossible. Okay. <laughs> Right, uh, so, so, so far we have topology, right? I told you how to take a triangle mesh and make a new triangle mesh with four times as many triangles, yeah? But what didn't I tell you? I didn't tell you where to put these guys. <laughs> I just told you how to subdivide sort of topologically, like connectivity-wise. Okay, so the next thing we have to do is actually place these things. And literally what Loop did was guess weights <laughs> that made it look like corner cutting. And I'm sure this was a painful process. Nowadays, we have mathematical description of why. It turns out this comes from tensor product surfaces. But what loop, uh, and this is largely just a formula, do not memorize this formula. Um, what he says is, for every blue vertex, I'm going to take a weighted average of his four neighbors with weights 1818 for the opposite vertices and 3 eighths for the parallel ones. Don't ask me why. I believe you actually can vary these and you'll get different smooth surfaces when you subdivide. Um, and now in loop subdivision, what he notices is if you do that, that's actually not enough because somehow these vertices are going to remain pointy when you, when you subdivide your mesh a bunch of times. So then what he actually does is replace the red vertices with weighted average of their, their one rings as well. Okay, so the, again, this is the kind of thing that you should take from 10 miles away. You shouldn't memorize this formula. The point here is that the first step was to subdivide every edge then the next step is you've got to place where these vertices should go, and essentially they're just weighted averages of their neighbors, just like in corner cutting. Okay? Okay. So, uh, that's the, uh, the loop uh, subdivision uh, scheme. There's one additional detail, which is you have to deal with extraordinary vertices, which is another term for irregular vertices. Um, so obviously you want the weights to add up to one or you might be in some trouble, right? So there's some adjustment that has to happen. So here's a loop subdivision in action. So we took this chess piece. This, I believe, is actually the chess piece from Jerry, Jerry's game's uh, chessboard that he's playing with. Um, and you can see what happens as I run this subdivision thing. Right, it gives me a new triangle mesh. I can forget that it came from subdivision. I can just put it right back in my subdivision code again and get a denser triangle mesh. And I keep doing that until I get something smooth. And the nice thing is that it's not so painful for an artist to model this object. But what he gets out for free is uh, a smooth uh, thing after that refinement procedure. That's the really beautiful thing about this technique. Something kind of cool about these subdivision schemes. You often can prove that this procedure generates a smooth surface, but what have I not done? I haven't given you a formula for that surface. This is a really mysterious thing mathematically. There are a lot of subdivision rules for which we know the subdivision procedure will reach something smooth, but we can't describe it in closed form. It's kind of surprising. Okay, so that's, uh, that's loop uh, subdivision. We've got, uh, we got about two minutes here, so let's, uh, let's start talking about Catmull clark So Catmull clark is designed for any polyhedral surface, so not just triangulated ones. Um, and uh, yeah, so now, now we need a new topological strategy, right? Because we can have objects that look like this, right? 
So Captain McClure is a little more complicated. The first thing we're going to do is insert what we call face points. This is the center of every polygon. We're going to stick a new vertex. This is topologically speaking. So when I say center, I don't mean like in 3D. I just mean I'm going to associate a point with the middle of every polygon here. Okay. And I'm going to subdivide every edge. Those are called edge points. So I know it's surprising. Now, how do you think I can get connectivity that looks like a surface out of this? Or do I have to somehow connect these guys to each other? It's real simple. I'm going to take this point. Who am I going to connect him to? Just the, the three new blue points. That'll do it, right? Because remember, this is just for polyhedral. I don't care about keeping things uh, triangle anymore. So there's our new uh, uh, connectivity. Okay, and now... Um, I need a geometric strategy uh, for placing these new points. And it's a little bit complicated. So essentially, just you know, this is mostly just fun trivia. In Captain Clark, what you do, you place the central point as the average of his, the four original points that it came from. And then every edge point ends up being the average of its two original neighbors and the two new guys that you just found. And then the old points, you actually have to replace their positions as well. And one thing you can show is that this procedure actually will uh, reach a bicubic B-spline surface. This is not at all obvious from the construction that I just gave you. Um, but it's kind of nice because whereas bicubic surfaces, the way that we describe them, required you to get like these rectangular patches, this procedure is like cubic at any point, but they can glue together in different ways. Right? They don't have to be uh, cubic, uh, globally speaking. Okay, so the high-level takeaway here is that subdivision is basically this kind of interesting strategy, right? Where you uptake the connectivity of your mesh to give you more degrees of freedom, more vertices. Then you place those vertices in a super careful way so that the object you get starts to approach a smooth surface. This is sort of half art and half science. People have uh, generated all kinds of cool subdivision schemes. This is like a very popular topic to study. Um, and, and different people like different things. Yeah. Um, right, so that's, that's the sort of high level takeaway. Uh, there are some disadvantages. I mean, these are not parametric surfaces, so like, I don't want the curvature of a, a B spline or a subdivision surface. It's not so clear how to compute it, or even the tangent for that matter. But what you uh, sort of pay for in, in math, you gain in, in algorithmic uh, quality. All right, any, uh, any questions about that? Excellent. So in 10 seconds or less, the remainder of the slides here are for you guys to look at. This is a description of your assignment. That gives you some hints on how to do it. Essentially, the assignment is going to be basically just implementing what we talked about. So you're first going to implement curves, and then you're going to sweep those curves along another curve uh, to get things like that wine glass. Um, we'll have you implement two different notions of sweeping. One is exactly what we did here, right, like tensor products. The other is just a surface of revolution. So you just sweep along a circle. Um, yeah. So I think with that, we'll stop for the day, and uh, I guess I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Get started with your assignments. At least try to compile them.